It's no secret in the United States that union membership has been on the decline. Despite a few upticks in some states in the last year, the average has remained at about 11%. In Tennessee, the United Auto Workers were trying to unionize a Volkswagen manufacturing plant, but lost the vote 54 to 46%. The UAW cried foul as it came to light that involvement of both state and federal Republican officials and anti-union groups issued not-so-thinly-veiled threats that jobs could be lost or would be lost if the UAW represented workers in collective bargaining agreements. If you only caught the highlights, you may have missed some of the players that were in the background and who pushed for a union defeat. Well, with me on Truth Out Interviews, to lend some clarity on the anti-union groups involved, is John Logan. He's a professor and director of labor and employment studies at San Francisco State University, and he has authored a piece on Truth Out that serves as a kind of primer for the anti-union groups that were involved in the UAW vote in Tennessee. John, welcome to Truth Out Interviews. Hi, glad to be on. First off, because union membership is is down, as I said in the preface, and very few Americans are actually members of a union, many people may be wondering, what's the point of a union? I'm in a union, and even among the membership in my union, there's some grumbling of people thinking, why do we even have this? So maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of labor unions in the United States. The reasons uh, the unions are still important. Now, if we compare uh, wages and benefits received by union and non-union workers in the same industry, for example, in the retail sector, uh, you, you can go to statistics produced by the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, and you know they'll pr- provide figures for this. It's very clear. Uh, that you know, being a member of a union still has very significant economic advantages, both in terms of wages, uh, but very noticeably in terms of benefits, in terms of healthcare benefits, in terms of pension benefits. Uh, union members do significantly better than their non-union counterparts. Um, it, it's also true. I mean, it's certainly true, as you said, that you know one can always find examples of union members who are ambivalent. You know, some even higher hostile to to their own union, Uh, but for the most part, uh, workers in the United States who have a union are, are very happy with the representation that they get. Now, I mean, all of the poll evidence that we have uh, you know, indicates that that's, that, that's true. Uh, the biggest study that was conducted by Richard Friedman at Harvard and Joel Rogers at University of Wisconsin uh, demonstrated that over 90% of workers who have a union would vote for their union again if an election were, her- were, were, were held uh, tomorrow, and that they were uh, very, very happy with the, uh, for the most part, with the representation that they they receive. The problem in the United States, compared with with almost any other rich democratic country, is that it's extraordinarily difficult uh, for non-union members to gain union membership. And why is that? The employees are really sort of forced uh, to go through, uh, you know, tremendous pressure, uh, you know, uh, by employers, by their law firms, by their outside consultants. They have to withstand tremendous pressure uh, if they want, uh, you know, to, to 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 get a union and to ultimately to vote for the union in a national labor relations board election. Uh, the the uh, NLRB election system functions in such a way uh, that. Uh, uh, often uh, unions withdraw petitions because employer campaigns are so effective. There are so many things that the employer can do during the course of a campaign um, uh, that, that, that that makes it very, very difficult you know, for the employees successfully to get a union. Mm-hmm. The millions of employees now that are, are defined as uh, freelancers or independent contractors or uh, uh, contingent workers, part-time workers, all sorts of workers who you know, do not fall under the definition of an employee under the National Labor Relations Act and therefore um, are, are, do, do not qualify for, for, for union representation. But even if you look at uh, the auto sector, you know, which we thought you know, we think of as the sort of traditional, stable, long-term jobs where unions like the United Auto Workers uh, you know, membership was based upon, uh, if, you, if you look at you know, 
know, uh, plants like uh, uh, Nissan in Tennessee or Mercedes in Alabama. Th these plants have huge numbers of temporary workers. Uh, so even if the union were to attempt to organize those plants, which, which it is trying to do, uh, you know, all of those temporary workers would not be eligible for union membership, would not be able to vote in the election. Because of the ways the laws are structured, I could see that. You know, we, we you, you were talking a little bit about the, the auto industry, and this dovetails nicely into my next question, which was, let's talk about the anti-union forces at work at the UAW uh, attempts to get into the VW plant in Tennessee. Now, did someone like Bob Corker, who you talk about in your primer, did he break any laws according to the UAW? According to the UAW, he did. And, you know, the NLRB will have to decide whether or not Corker's comments, whether the governor, Bill Haslam's comments, whether the comments made by other senior state lawmakers actually amount to unlawful uh, threats and intimidation. Uh, now, you know, most, uh, you know, in most cases where there's a complaint uh, of intimidation and interference with workers' vote, it's because the employer is in interfering with workers' vote. Here, you had a very unusual set of circumstances. Volkswagen remained neutral during the election. Most American employers do not do that. It's very, very uh, rare for an employer to remain neutral, but it does happen. And when it happens, unions win the overwhelming majority of those cases. Uh, but here, uh, what you had is Volkswagen remaining neutral and uh, all of these leading uh, state politicians uh, and a U.S. senator in the case of Corker uh, speaking out in such a way that it was clear that they were trying to send a message to the employees uh, that if you vote for the UAW, your employment security is going to be threatened as a result of that vote. And not only that, is that they were suggesting that they had the ability to, to act upon those threats. Uh, you add to that is that, you know, again, this was completely unprecedented. We had all of these national anti-union organizations uh, with links to, to Grover Norquist, uh, with the, the, the so-called Center for Worker Freedom is a special project of, of, of Norquist, uh, with links to the Koch brothers, uh, with links to other right-wing activists descended uh, upon this sort of small community in Tennessee with the sole purpose of, of, of spreading uh, disinformation and of scaring the workers against voting uh, 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 for the union. And no, we didn't even really know the full extent. We knew that this campaign was going on before the vote. We certainly heard the threats. Everyone heard the threats that were made by the governor, by Senator Corker, by others. Uh, but we we didn't really know the full extent of the campaign. What has emerged since the vote, and as you say, the, the UAW uh, narrowly lost the vote, and you know, most people uh, beforehand had expect them to, to win this vote, uh, is that uh, 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 Nashville based uh, Tennessee, uh, sorry, a Nashville based television station uh, has uh, got hold of emails that were sent by Corker's chief of staff, has got hold of confidential documents that were sent by the governor to Volkswagen uh, that, that provide an enormous amount of detail uh, about the anti-union campaign and show that the governor's chief of staff was actually in direct contact with anti-union organizations about uh, the messaging and about the strategy to defeat the UAW. Right. And you say it's unprecedented, but is there are uh, alleged illegalities here. And that was the interference of the, of the third party, essentially. That's what the UAW is alleging here, that the conduct of, of Corker, of the governor, of other state politicians, and the fact that the, the, their threats and uh, intimidation uh, was repeated by these organizations and, in fact, coordinated with these anti-union organizations amounts to unlawful threats and, uh, uh, under, and unlawful uh, interference under the National Labor Relations Act. These are direct threats. They were basically saying, you vote for the union, you'll lose your job. 
they were saying that if the workers vote for the UAW, you won't get, uh, the company won't uh, get a continuation of the hundreds of millions of dollars in tax incentives and cash incentives that are critical to the continuation of these jobs in Tennessee. And, and that was stated explicitly, and it was also stated directly uh, by the governor in a letter that you know he had denied that he had ever sent to Volkswagen, saying, uh, you know, we will offer you two hundred and ninety million, uh, sorry, two hundred and ninety-eight million dollars in in incentives, but this is based on the satisfactory outcome of the NLRB election. You know, since uh, since roughly thirty plus years ago, we saw a big deindustrialization of the United States. Capitalism is now global. Uh, since the winning of the Cold War, what 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 we won was the ability of capital to leave whole ge- uh, geographical regions in order to set up shop somewhere else where the labor is cheaper. Um, the union uh, a- unions and anti union forces have certainly battled throughout the history in the United States since uh, union mem- uh, union labor um, labor forces have have. Uh, ask for for better wages, better working conditions, and so forth. What we have also in the United States is certain regions that have been very anti-union, the South being one of them. Now, granted, around the United States, union membership is low. There are some spikes in some in some states and so forth. But when you look at the, the, the realm of global capitalism, meaning that we have to be competitive with, say, Mexico or Venezuela or wherever these places are that, they, that these companies want to set up manufacturing plants, uh, one of the things, at least it seems like what the southern states are doing is saying that we don't have any union membership here, so labor is cheaper. So is that one of the things why the South is so anti-union? Is it because they're trying to remain economically competitive or is there some other things going on here? Well, that, that, that's certainly what they say. I, I mean, they say that, you know, the fact that they're right to work, the fact that they're you know, virtually union free in many cases in the private sector, although, you know, certainly there are variations within the South and, you know, Alabama, for example, union memberships significantly higher than it is in the Carolinas and so on. Um, but they say that, you know, a key to their economic competitiveness is uh, the fact that you know, unions are, are you know, almost completely absent from the South. Uh, it's not entirely clear if the right to work, if the absence of unions is a major attraction for these firms. And in fact, I don't think that the Southern politicians really have ever been able to prove that, you know, for Mercedes, for BMW, for for Volkswagen, uh, the reason that they located in the South was because, you know, they want, you know, they didn't want to deal with unions. And certainly that's not the case with Volkswagen just now, as I said, you know, Volkswagen would have been delighted. So, you as you said, you know, historically, the South has been uh, more anti-union than the rest of the company. And often when a union tries to organize in the South, it faces not only uh, hostility from the employer, which is a nationwide phenomenon, it's not something that's restricted to the South, but, you know, you have the entire local business community and local political establishment uh, mobilizing against the union. Mm -hmm. We're now in a, a, a sort of a curious situation where you have an entire region of the country uh, politically it seems to be in opposition to what federal law says. So what you had at Volkswagen was not, as I say, it just a sort of normal uh, you know, opposition to the union. There was really a sort of conspiracy of the state to undermine federal law in Tennessee. Briefly, what are, what are the next steps? I mean, you alluded to it a little bit. What, how do you think this is going to play out? What what is a NLRB trying to do? What are the what's the UAW trying to do in terms of yeah. saying this wasn't fair? What happened? This was interference. It's illegal, and we want either a revote or some kind of remedy to what's going on. You know, I think there could well be a lot of twists and turns and unexpected developments still to come in this particular case. The problem with the board proceedings is that, you know, they're notoriously slow. Uh, so there's going to be, uh, you know, hearings at the, the, you know, in Chattanooga NLRB office starting uh, next week. And, you know, we could get a decision from the, the, the regional office, you know, within a month or so 
so. But then there would be appeals that would go to the national boards. That could take months. It could take many months. I mean, one of the things that was disclosed, as I mentioned, was an email from Corker's chief of staff to, to you know, uh, half a dozen different anti-union organizations, business groups, state politicians. This was only one email. But what it showed is that there was a high degree of familiarity between all of the recipients of the email. Clearly, they had been in contact a lot about this anti-union campaign. So we don't really know the full involvement of these different groups, what exactly they did, what 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 unlawful acts they may have committed. So I, I, I think there's still a lot more to come out about the campaign, and I, I think it will. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for being on Truth Out Interviews. I'm very happy to be on. Thank you. John Logan is a professor and director of Labor and Employment Studies at San Francisco State University, and you can read his article on Truth Out called A Primer on Anti-Union Campaigns at Volkswagen. And that's Truth Out Interviews for another week. I'm Ted Asvergadu. See you next time.